All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us again on um, on this Thursday with our homegrown lecture series. Uh, as you can see, we're looking forward to the new year, uh, but I do want to say this is our second to last talk with Shannon Dietz. Do you want to be a rancher? Um, so you want to be a rancher. And then I have my talk. Uh, Brandy Keller in two weeks in two Thursdays on how to make holiday plants uh, last. Uh, so other than that plug, I will just say that this is our new flyer. We, there is a change. We are going to just be presenting once a month and it will be on the first Thursday at the same time though, 10 o'clock. Uh, so we have each quarter laid out here, uh, the first, second, third, and fourth quarter. So you can see everything that we are presenting for the entire year. Uh, as a reminder, uh, when you sign up for these talks, uh, you can sign up for um, any of them at any time. So, you know, it's just not available to sign up for the next one. If you're looking forward and you see, you know, like six or seven that you like, you can go ahead and register for those now. And when you register, you will get the, um, the link for that. And then you also be emailed um, the YouTube video. And then, of course, you get our uh, homegrown newsletter and all that kind of good stuff. So there's an advantage to signing up. And then we, uh, Brandy, I don't mean to yeah. catch up, but yesterday yeah. uh, Paul and I were talking on the Eventbrite page. If you if you click the follow button mm -hmm. um, for us, and I don't know if that's what you were referencing, but I, I um, but you'll get updates and notices whenever we have up, um, upcoming programs and everything. So always click that follow button. Yeah, no, I, I I did not address that. So that's a good point. Um, so yeah, uh, on that, once you sign up and you click follow, yeah, then you don't have to worry about missing anything. Uh, Shannon, if you can take it to the next slide. All right. So the next one is the podcast. This is still um, pretty new. Uh, we've done six or seven now. I think Paul's going to be releasing one, or maybe he did uh, <laughs> look it's just they keep going by so quickly um, but I think the last one was by Shannon and that was a really interesting one talking uh, to the um, Harris County Sheriff's Office agriculture or livestock division right. um, so you know I learned something I didn't even know there was a position for that uh, so those uh, can be downloaded and you can listen to them anytime and, and goodness knows we have plenty of time around this uh, Houston traffic that we have time to listen all right so your speaker today is county extension agent uh, in our for agriculture and natural resources, Shannon Dietz. This is his last one for the year. And uh, so you want to be a rancher. Uh, so we're going to, I think we're going to find out some really fun stuff today. So Shannon, it is all yours. Thank you for doing this. All right. Thank you, Brandy, for that, that introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Shannon Dietz, County Ag and Natural Resources Agent with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension based here in Harris County. Uh, it's always a good time to come to speak to um, to those of you who might be uh, in Harris County and those who might be throughout the state of Texas and those or or, or those people beyond our um, state line. So welcome to everyone. Uh, it's a beautiful day here in Houston. Uh, temperature is probably about 70 degrees uh, beautiful sunny day. So uh, yes, we are winding down the, the year um, and not too far away from um, uh, the Christmas holidays and everything. So uh, let me be the first to wish you all uh, a Merry Christmas and uh, hope that everyone's doing well this year. So uh, I decided on this topic because I do get numerous calls into the office every day on people uh, who actually live here in Harris County um, or might live um, outside of Harris County and they are interested in becoming a farmer slash rancher. And we're going to be using those uh, terms or terminology kind of interchangeably today because they do, uh, you can't really have one without the other. All right. So 
Uh, don't get too hung up on the word rancher. Uh, we welcome everybody here. Uh, we're gonna be sharing some, some great information um, that might pertain to you maybe currently or maybe in the near future. Uh, if you're looking at buying land uh, somewhere other than Harris County, um, which we all know there isn't that much land left to purchase, unfortunately, here in Harris County. Uh, but the rest of the state of Texas is big and bold with lots of land and uh, just wanting you to get out there and uh, start your own ranch or your farm. So I thought it was a kind of a cool cartoon. I don't know if how many of you remember uh, this cartoon that floated around probably about 15, 20 years ago about the two guys, uh, the two little boys you've been farming long. Um, it's just kind of uh, takes me back. And uh, it was kind of cool because they're both wearing their little uh, blue stripe uh, overalls uh, that my dad used to wear and so forth. So uh, I thought that that was kind of cool to get started off with. So let's go ahead and start talking about so you want to be a rancher. All right. So today we're going to cover some of our topics are going to be the history of ranching in Texas. And some of you who've listened to some of my past presentations, uh, you know that I really, really have a strong interest in agriculture um, and uh, the history of agriculture in the state of Texas uh, and how we've evolved over the many hundreds of years and so forth. So we're going to touch a little bit about that. And then we're going to talk about what it takes to be a rancher in 2021, 22, and moving forward. Some of the new technology that's out there uh, to help farmers and ranchers improve their their product and so forth, and get the most money for um, their product to be able to sustain their family and so forth and their ranches. We're going to talk a little bit about what you want to have on your farm, whether it's going to be a livestock. Um, project or if it's going to be a crop project or if it's going to be a, a conservation project or many different things and everything and we're going to talk about how some of the agencies that are near here in Harris County can uh, help you with some funding sources on that and then like I said we're going to talk about resources available to you as a rancher uh, and again uh, don't get too hung up on the word rancher or farmer um, getting caught up in um, like the big acreages that we're used to hearing about like in Texas you can be a backyard farmer if you like or you can be an urban farmer um, so really a lot of this information is taken and you can adapt it to whatever situation that you're in um, don't, so don't always think large scale. You can think medium scale, small scale and so forth like that. So, um, you know, and again, if also uh, if you have questions, Brandy is going to be monitoring the chat box. Uh, so feel free to type your question in there. We'll take breaks. Uh, if you have any questions out there, you can post them there. Um, otherwise, you can send me an email, which I will be sharing with you at the end of the presentation. So ranching since the early 1800s, um, as we know, Texas has a long history of uh, cattle production uh, here in the state of Texas, and the original cattle came over uh, from the Spaniards um, around the area of the El Paso region, um, crossing the Rio Grande out in that area, and then um, they started to migrate uh, from Mexico more along the river, the Rio Grande and so forth, whenever we had the introduction of the Spanish missionaries and the missions that were going up. Uh, it was an, uh, a, a process that kind of evolved to the missions went away. Um, like, uh, you know, the famous mission that we all think of is, um, you know, in San Antonio um, and the remnants of that one are still standing, but um, at one time, you can see that it was that is basically in the middle of San Antonio now. But at one time, obviously, like most of the state of Texas was just barren uh, cropland or no uh, native grassland, not cropland, but native grassland. And that was just kind of free range. Um, the cattle really didn't have any boundaries and so forth. It wasn't until the introduction of barbed wire that uh, farmers really started sectioning off their their homesteads if you will because a lot of times um it really didn't matter where the cattle roamed and everything you had your cowboys out there uh you had uh people watching over them uh, they were usually around a water source and so forth like that so um 
actually we still have some some uh, large farms here in Texas uh, that have survived over the years and they've been passed down through generations and so forth. Uh, King Ranch is a big one uh, down in um, Kleberg and Kennedy counties along the um, the coast of southern Texas. And there's just a really, really rich history of uh, cattle production and cattle drives and so forth like that in the state of Texas. And I'm just going to share some pictures here with you. The first one is of a chuck wagon um, and showing the glamorous life of the cowboys laying around, probably eating their charro beans and some cornbread that the uh, the uh, the the chuck maggot chuck wagon master uh, kind of whipped up and everything. Um, next picture is uh, horse wrangling. Um, a lot of horses that were used uh, to monitor and that the cowboys needed horses on were wild horses out in the West and they were literally wild. So they had to be tamed. Uh, they would come up to herds of wild horses and they would actually rope and lasso them and everything and they would break them. And then that's what the cowboys would use and so forth. So uh again cattle were um just like cattle were introduced into the united states horses were introduced as well with the native uh horses that were here as well um just some more pictures and the last picture just kind of shows you how we evolved uh we actually have um a female woman sitting on on horseback there and she's on a cattle drive uh whether it be a pleasure one or work one or whatever but you can see that uh how times have changed that we really didn't have women uh, involved in cattle drives before, uh, but now women have played or are playing a, a more important role in the day to day life of agriculture. And they want to get out there and they want to um, experience this 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 um, this opportunity as well. So um, it's an equal opportunity uh, event working cattle and so forth like that on ranches. Uh, and not only ranchers, but women are becoming more significant and playing more important roles in different forms, uh, whether it be row crops, whether it be agriculture business, agriculture law, uh, agriculture um, science and so forth. So um, there is definitely uh, no barriers out there when it comes to uh, talking about agriculture. And now we bring forward up until uh, now in 2021 and moving forward, uh, the sky's the limit basically. So uh, I have a couple pictures here posted that um, kind of show some of the technology, just a few examples of the technology that are out there that's really changing the face of agriculture and not only changing the face of agriculture, but improving the role of agriculture in our society. Um, Farmers are um, working less land and producing more crops, more cattle uh, with less resources and everything. But with that, technology is being introduced. You can see the first picture up at the top is actually a, a, a cab in a tractor or a combine. And um, they have installed GPS and GIS uh, monitors in these cabs where a lot of times the farmer or the rancher will put these uh, the coordinates in in their cab and the cab the tractor or the combine is self-driven by uh, computer technology um, and so uh, with that obviously the cost of machinery has become more significant um, but it has uh, time and time has showed that it's been a time uh, uh, a time saver better on time management and so forth like that um, the next picture, you see some drones, um, not only are drones for recreational purposes and everything, but they're also meant for agriculture use. Uh, you'll see in the picture of the drone, they have a little plastic container just sitting right under the motor and everything. And these drones have um, are working with agriculture and spot uh, spot pesticide and herbicide treatment, whereas one time a farmer might have to spray a full field um, and incur that cost of uh, hundreds and hundreds of dollars. But now they can go in and do spot uh, treatments for weeds and pests and so forth. So they have actually technology where they can determine 
what areas of the field need spraying and so forth like that. And this cuts down on groundwater contamination and so forth. So you don't have as much herbicide and pesticide floating in the environment or getting into the um, soil and getting into the groundwater system and everything. So uh, they have become better stewards of the land over the years and so forth. The next picture you'll see <clears throat> just an example of how uh, machinery and GIS and GPS can all work together. A lot of times a farm family can control um, equipment from the comfort of their living room or the farmer's office or if they're out in the barn. Um, it's all about satellite signals and so forth like that. So you have handheld devices, you have tablets and everything. So these are all actually become more important in the daily lives of a cattle former rancher, kind of, if you will. And then the last one, you'll see um, a cow there with an ear tag in its ear, but there's a green glowing light. So this is some new technology that actually started off in Australia and is being more widely introduced here in the United States, that that light can actually determine there is um, a special ear tag that is placed on that heifer uh, out in the field and it monitors when that cow might be sick or it's um, it's got something wrong with it or what have you. So the green light is an indication that the farmer can go out there and spot that cow and find out if there's something wrong with it or if it needs to be taken away from the herd, um, if it has uh, something that can be done that they need to call the vet in for and different things like that. So the green light is easier to identify that particular cow. But again, it's all transmitted through an ear tag that uh, is originally placed on 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 the cattle. Um, and so a lot of these ear tags now where you used to have, say, for example, you have 100 or so acres and you kind of just have your cattle out there kind of free roam and so forth like that. Um, these ear tags also help um, locate cattle if they get lost and so forth. So a lot of technology out there. So I just wanted to kind of introduce you to a couple of things um, and make you aware that farmers uh, have really stepped up their game uh, from what they used to be operating with just one or two tractors in the past with a simple plow and so forth and really was debating on um, if it was going to, what the temperature, what the weather was going to be like, uh, maybe now or a couple months from now, when was, how that was going to affect planting season. And again, that's all technology that's available to you if you're starting in the industry at this time. So big bucks for Texas economy. Cattle ranching is still an important part of the Texas economy. Uh, in 2012, Texas grows 10.5 billion. That is with a B in cattle production. We are the largest cattle producing state in the United States. Um, and that is approximately state, half of the state's commodities. The Lone Star State is number one in beef cattle production, which I talked about, and is home to 248,000 farms and ranches totaling 130, a little over 130 million acres. So this particular family here, I took this off the uh, HEB website. Um, a lot of farmers have gotten really smart and they have started working with individual retailers and so forth. So uh, this is uh, an effort on both parts where, say for example, HEB is really focusing on getting to know who they're buying their, their meat from and so forth, whether it be pork, whether it be cattle, whether it be lamb, different things like that, because as you as a producer and myself as a producer, we like to know where that that meat is being raised and how it's being raised. If it's being raised humanely, is it being raised on grass fed? Is it being uh, raised on um, grain? Uh, you know, and so a lot of farmers uh, here in Texas have gotten wise and they are partnering with a lot of these large retailers now whether it be HEB, Walmart, Kroger, uh, grocery stores and so forth like that to get their product on the shelves. Um, whereas before in the past, they used to deal with a lot of small independent um, producers and butchers and different things like that. Now, whenever you have a couple thousand head, 
you have that quantity to be able to go to a large scale uh, retailer and say, I can get you X, Y, Z amount of pounds, you know, are you interested in working with us? And so there's a lot of those relationships that have really developed over the past couple of years. Um, so we talked about the term rancher and farmer, um, and we talked about how they're interchangeable and so forth. And so uh, just a little graphic here on, remember how I told you way in the beginning, you can't really have one without the other because, and as we go through here, um, just some fun facts that, you know, as a rancher, uh, they usually refer to the land as pastures, but if you're a crop producer or so forth, you usually refer to them as fields. And then normally in the barns, you would have equipment on one side for uh, those farmers and you would have cattle on the other side if you were a rancher. But what happens here is when you're a farmer, if you're a farmer, you need to cut your cost or be as conscious about your cost as what you're feeding your cattle. You don't necessarily always want to go out and have to purchase everything because that's going to cut into your bottom line and so forth. So if you're a farmer and a rancher, if say, for example, we have a lot of those here in the state of Texas where they're a farmer and they produce hay or they produce native grassland and they bale that hay several times throughout the year and they store that hay for winter um, feed for their cattle, they don't have to go out and purchase this from another um, feed store or another farmer or different things like that. So um, it's smart whenever you can combine the two of them together because again, it's gonna help your bottom line. Uh, obviously, as you have more and more costs going out the door, your bottom line is gonna keep going lower and lower. So, um, so that's that's an interesting topic um, or just a, a graphic on sharing the two of them. The next thing I want to share with you guys is some fast facts about food and agriculture. And um, I, I tried to do it where we were gonna fill in the lines with some guesses and so forth, but it didn't work like that. So I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, put the, the statement out there and make you aware of it. So a little over 2 million farms currently are across America's rural landscape, 2 million farms. So that's that's actually down from its peak. And we're gonna show you a graphic about that a little bit later than um, roughly around the 30s and the 40s, just before the, the dust bowl, the drought and everything, we were at a peak of about 6 6.3, 6.5 million farms across America's landscape. But as we become more urbanized, um, those numbers have definitely don't, going down. One farm feeds about 166 people annually in the U.S. and abroad. A lot of people don't think that we as uh, producers here in the United States only feed our American people. Um, we have plenty of surplus. We produce more food here than we have uh, that we can feed people and so forth. Unfortunately, uh, you know, there are people that fall through the cracks and, you know, um, there, there's still um, a great need for hungry people in um, the United States and the United States Department of Agriculture is trying to do its best in getting those uh, commodities out there um, and getting to those um, populations that are um, in need of food and so forth like that. So that's why it's always important if you can do your role uh, help to partner with USDA and contribute. This is the time where you help your, your friends and neighbors and so forth like that. So if you see somebody doing a food drive or something like that, make sure you check your pantry if you need to get rid of anything. About 11% of US farmers are serving or have served in the military. Uh, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension actually has a program called Breaking a Battleground of Breaking Ground, which focuses on educating um, veterans on how they can become producers, uh, whether they be become row crop producers, producing uh, cotton, corn, wheat, different things like that, or livestock producers where they're producing cattle, sheep, goats, and pigs, and different things like that. So if there are any veterans on the line today uh, and you want more information about that, we will be having a program in Tomball. Um, I think that will be on Friday, January 28th. 
if you want more information or if you know a veteran that's interested, uh, there are a lot of programs and incentives that the United States Department of Agriculture has in place that uh, they can receive um, uh, incentives for um, through tax breaks and um, loans and different things like that. So if you know of a veteran or if you're a veteran and you want more information about that, uh, definitely feel free to email me and I can share more information with you about that. And if you are a veteran, yes. Can I can I just add to that? Yeah. So um, so I'm glad you br brought that up. Um, but the battleground uh, to breaking ground, um, like what Shannon was saying, there's individual courses, but uh, there's one big course. It's three phases um, that really covers, uh, you know, how to apply for loans and then going into even how to farm. And it takes you to some different locations. Um, if you are a veteran or active duty, uh, there's actually a scholarship basically that you can get. Um, but that one is actually due tomorrow, December 3rd. So if you are live listening, um, I know it's not going to help for, you know, the recorded video. Uh, just email uh, Shannon or myself and we can get that to you. But that um, that deadline is tomorrow. Uh, if you want to pay the full price, uh, which together it would be about $1,500. Fifteen hundred dollars. That that um, that deadline is in January. However, this is by I guess by yearly. So if you miss it this year, still reach out or right now, you can still reach out to one of us and we can um, hook you up with getting that information uh, for the next go round. So Ooh, thank good. you. Thanks, Sorry Frank. about that, Shannon. Yeah, no, no, no problem. Uh, great information. But uh, I will let you know that the the event that's happening on Friday, January twenty eighth will not be costing $1,500. I think we're actually looking at getting that covered. There might be a small expense uh, incurred on that, but I think it's going to be, if anything, less than $50 or something. So uh, this will be a more condensed version of that one that Brandy was talking about. All right, so 86% um, of U.S. ag products are produced on family farms or ranches. Pretty high number there, but after accounting for all input costs and all those um, expenses that farmers and ranchers uh, put out on a yearly basis, only about eight cents out of every dollar of uh, is spent on food at home. One acre of land. So again, you don't need 20 acres, you don't need 30 acres, you don't need 100 acres and everything. Uh, one acre or two acre plot can really make a difference. Uh, if you're interested in starting small and then eventually getting much larger, which is something I highly suggest because it is quite an endeavor when you start to take on a lot of this information and so forth. So unless you have somebody who you can count on as a mentor and you're doing this yourself, it is a process. So don't get overwhelmed with it. But again, uh, 50,000 pounds of strawberries or almost or a little over 2,500 pounds of wheat can pr be produced on one acre of land. So again, don't get overwhelmed there. How about butter? Uh, dairies used to be a really common thing around here. We don't see a lot of them anymore, not until you get up into North Texas and like the Midwest and so forth. But a day's production of a high producing dairy cow can produce about 4.8 pounds of butter, a little over eight and a half gallons of ice cream or 10 and a half pounds of cheese. So um, again, that's just from one dairy cow. So you look at some of these dairy industries and dairy dairy houses, they have hundreds of cows in there. So it you have to really uh, take in mind that, you know, we have several million people, uh, what we have, you know, just here in um, Harris County, we're approaching like six, six million people. Um, the whole United States, probably about 30, 40, 50 million people. So we have to have a lot of animal production uh, in place on a daily basis to be able to feed and um, feed our our brothers and sisters and our neighbors. Unfortunately, Americans throw away about 25% of the food they purchase for at home consumption. I'm sometimes bad about that. I go to the grocery store, I go to the farmer's market and I overbuy. Uh, I've really made a personal goal of uh, trying to get better with doing that. Um, really planning out my meals for the week or the day and so forth and really only buying what I need to. Um, fresh produce 
is always going to go quicker on you or it's going to spoil quicker. Uh, your meat, if you take it home and you refrigerate it and you're going to be using it in a day or two, uh, that's not a problem. Or you can always freeze it if you have a large freezer and you can get by with um, you know, more long range on that. But uh, obviously, uh, all of us have been to the grocery store and know that um, just for example, like avocados break down really quick uh, if you don't if you buy them somewhat soft tomatoes um lettuce different things like that so they don't have a long shelf life so plan accordingly when you do purchase some of that stuff u.s crop values just to kind of give you an economic standpoint of where we are as the united states uh cash receipts for 2020 you can see that corn and soybeans uh are definitely the top go-getters uh roughly about uh 46 a uh, billion dollars brought in on corn and 36 billion brought in on soybeans. Overall, 192 billion dollars in total receipts uh, from hay, cotton, wheat, vegetables, and so forth like that. So um, you're gonna, a lot of those, uh, the corn and soybean fields are gonna be out in the Midwest uh, where they have uh, thousands of acres as you pass, just nothing but corn and soybeans and maize and milo and different things like that. U.S. animal values, so we talked about crop values in the slide just before it, but now we're talking about anim animal values. You can see uh, far and above uh, cattle and cows uh, dominate the market with a little over $63 billion in cash receipts. Uh, also listed there, poultry and eggs, that's another example. Uh, you can be a small scale uh, poultry producer. Uh, whether you produce um, and you you butcher your own um, uh, hens or you use the hens for uh, lay, egg laying purposes and stuff like that. So again, I've done uh, a presentation on that. It's on the YouTube channel, how to get up, get set up with your backyard poultry project and so forth like that. So if you're interested in going back and reviewing some of those, you can do that. So it doesn't take a lot of room. Um, hogs uh your pork industry uh coming in strong just a little over 20 billion dollars and we talked about this a little earlier a while ago um the number of acreage dedicated to agriculture production in the united states you'll see that around 1935 we peaked at right under 7 million forms um and that was during uh, <clears throat> the age where uh, there were a lot more families in rural areas and we had a lot more production going on for home use and so forth. And as urbanization happened through the 50s and 60s and 70s, people moved away from those rural areas and moved more into the towns and the cities and so forth. You can see a steady uh, decrease in the land, the number of farms uh, around 1974, or right around 2 million and it's kind of held steady around that 2 million plus or minus 100,000 forms and so forth. But you can see also um, the average form size in 100 acres per form, uh, that roughly is around that that uh, that four level um, and that peaked around 1964 and pretty, pretty been stand, um, staying steady at that point. Land and forms, um, you can see that's been a pretty steady line there as well. So we're actually producing more food, uh, more resources for our American uh, public with less land and so forth. So that goes to show you how technology um, has really improved the um, ability to produce more uh, for a more amount of people. So the next thing I want to talk to you a little bit about is that we get a lot of calls uh, here at the office on uh, ag valuations or ag exemptions. Um, unfortunately, we do not handle those calls here. That's handled through the Harris County Appraisal District, which is actually right next door to us here on Northwest Freeway. Um, and we have a really good relationship with them. <clears throat> if you are a farmer or rancher, um, Product, if you've never heard of ag exemptions, these ag exemptions can actually lower the tax base on your land. So basically, if you have a certain amount of agriculture that you produce on your land, 
whether it be cattle, whether it be corn, uh, bees, and I'm gonna give you some example about this on, on the next slide. You can act, your land is actually revalued where it's not the real estate value, but it's the agriculture value. So it's based on a completely different um, formula and it actually can save you money. So if you're interested in doing that, um, I have the contact information here and that's the Harris County Appraisal District. Ms. Melissa Brody is over there um, and her and her team are willing to help you uh, help answer any questions that you might have. Um, and I'm going to share their website with you just in a minute uh, where you can actually go. But if you Google Harris County Appraisal District Har um, here in Houston or in Texas in Harris County, I'm sorry, and each county in Texas has their own appraisal district. So what goes on here or what the rules are, what the formulas are for uh, agriculture might not be the same in Waller County, it might not be the same in Galveston County or Montgomery County, etc. So you have to make sure that you're checking with the appraisal district in the county that you have your farm, your ranch or your your land in if you want to get an ag exemption for that. All right. So just making sure you're aware of that. Um, but you can see some examples there. If you want a, an ex, a ag exemption for hay, you would have to have a minimum of seven acres and ACS is an abbreviation for acres. So I didn't spell that wrong. So just so you know that uh, exotic animals, which has gotten to be really big uh, here in the state of Texas with um, uh, those types of farms and those types of ranches, you have to have at least seven acres of that beekeeping five to 20 acres of that. So yes, you can get an ag exemption for having beehives on your land. And it goes through and talks about orchard and timber. And these are just a few examples of what some of them um, you can get ag exemptions for. Like say, for example, if you have timber, it makes a difference if it's native hardwood or if it's pine or if it's, um, you know, oak or anything like that. So there, there um, if you go to your county and you Google um, your ag exemption, it'll, it'll break down what you need for a minimum purpose uh, on that land in order to be able to get that, that tax uh, evaluation. So now we're going to talk about uh, some resources for new and existing landowners, uh, which is what most of you are here for if you're, if you're signed on today. Um, these are just a few of them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Google Earth. If you've never been on Google Earth and you want to get an aerial view, if you want to, you are able to, and the NRCS Web Soil Survey, both of those are really good as far as getting aerial views of your particular plot of land. Uh, the Web Soil Survey is through NRCS, which is the Natural Resource Conservation Service. You can actually, on both of these, put your coordinates in for your particular acreage, wherever it's at in anywhere in the world, um, United States, Texas or, or Harris County or what have you, and it will pull up any water sources, any um, any forest that you have on that land, and it kind of gives you an aerial topography of what you're working with, a blueprint, if you will, and so forth. And the web soil survey is actually really good because it kind of helps you determine, well, it does help you determine what that soil um, is made up of you know, before you go in and plant any crops and different things like that. Texas Farm Bureau capital credit, capital farm credit and Texas Department of Agriculture are all also good resources. Um, and I'm sure Brandy's typing in some of these uh, web links in the chat box. Um, if you want a copy of all the links from today, you can contact me um, or Miss Susan at the office. We'll be glad to share those with you via email. I know there's a lot of information being thrown at you, especially on this uh, presentation today, but uh, don't get overwhelmed and don't feel like you missed anything on a particular slide. Again, you can go back and watch it um, for later on. So educational government agencies, we have a lot of resources out there that not sure some of you take advantage of, but they are all usually free. Uh, especially with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. And that's where we're going to start off with our first slide. Um, the first one is new landowners. It's a really good 
uh, web page that gives you breakdown of uh, some hyperlinks of where you can go to to find out more information and so forth like that. Brush Busters is a really good one. It's a program that we have with Texas A&M uh, Extension Service. If you have a particular piece of land that's really overgrown and a lot of brush, we satch or uh, uh, honey locust trees or a lot of undergrowth that you want to go out and clean. Uh, this the Brush Busters website is a really good website to kind of go in and tell you what you can do to get that more manageable, get it under control, whether it's going to be through um, manual uh, labor or through chemical process and different things like that, or a combination of both of those. Um, and then the next couple programs or uh, hyperlinks there that we have um, are focusing on beef, horse, and sheep. We do have a big uh, equine uh, community here in Harris County and throughout the state of Texas. Uh, horses are important to Texas just as much as cattle are. So um, uh, we have an equine science department, not only with A&M Extension Service, but also with A&M the University. And um, sheep, sheep and goats, that's all covered under the same particular area. Um, and they have a really good website for that as well. Moving on to some of our government agencies, government agencies, and these again are free of charge as well. Uh, and I just kind of lump both of them together, FSA and NRCS. So FSA is the Farm Service Agency. And like I said, the NRCS is the Natural Resource Conservation Office or Services. And we do have an office here in Harris County. They're located on Huffmeister Road. And uh, Ms. K is the executive director for the um, FSA office, super nice lady. Um, and they were kind of close to the general public during the pandemic. I'm not sure if they are open to the general public or not. I should have checked on that before, but um, you can always give them a call. Um, she and her, her, her a team there are always willing to answer any questions. I know that you do have to fill out paperwork with them before you can move forward with any type of loans or programs or incentives through USDA. So they should be high up on your list as far as who you contact first of all. Um, and then farmers.gov, that's a, a USDA website, really good information um, as far as what a, a beginning farmer needs, uh, some networking on there, and it has a really good um, couple pages dedicated to uh, military veterans and also women in agriculture and uh, minority farmers there as well. Um, a lot of people don't think about when it comes to farming or ranching, conservation and wildlife. Um, you can be a farmer or a rancher and focus your um, your your produce or your, your product, I guess, if, if on that particular area. You don't actually have to have cattle out there ranging. You can have, um, there are different types of deer. Uh, there are different types of native grasses, depending on where you're at in the state uh, that you might want to focus on. And those are all the things that the NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service, can help you with um, actually creating a conservation plan, actually creating a wildlife uh, improvement plan and so forth. So. They have, uh, we have um, great people here in Harris County to help you with those programs. And uh, so feel free to take advantage of them and reach out to them. Like I said, uh, Ms. K works with uh, FSA and Mr. J Knight works with the NRCS program and they will be glad to answer any questions that you have with that. So you can easily Google, Google them. Let's talk a little bit about the pros and cons of farming and ranching. And you know, when we, everybody always gets excited about starting a new project and uh, especially when it becomes, comes to farming. Uh, I've had numerous calls here that uh, people want to give up their corporate job and they want to uh, purchase land and they want to start living off the land and providing food for their family. And what do they need to do and what book do they need to read? Well, it's a little bit more involved than that. And usually, um, you know, the first thing that we have to worry about is land. Uh, so if you're gonna, if you're kind of uh, not mobile and you're looking at having a farm or ranch or any type of backyard garden 
that can produce anything here in Houston, um, land is going to be at a premium. So you might have to reach out to uh, several other counties and maybe look into that. Texas Farm Credit, um, like I said, they have uh, real estate agents on there and they're, they focus specifically on farm and ranch property. Uh, if you're looking for property in other counties, you're going to want to make sure that you uh, end up with a, a, a real estate broker that focuses on cropland or farmland or uh, ranches and farms and different things. So you might be able to buy something that is, is already in place uh, and the people are retiring, or you might just buy something, um, just a piece of flat land and you develop it yourself. So it really depends on uh, your experience level, your resources, how much time you want to spend on it and so forth. But let's talk about the pros first. Obviously, you get to be your own boss. Um, you are the one that makes all the decisions. Um, you can get resources and information from other people, but ultimately it comes down to you. You get to be a good steward of the land. Hopefully um, you would take advantage of a lot of the resources out there. And nowadays we're not using as many chemicals and uh, pesticides and so forth. We're going more green, we're going more natural, uh, we're going more native species and different things like that. So those are all things in the big picture. You get to be a part of the long history of agriculture in the United States. Uh, everybody's really uh, intrigued about like, uh, you know, uh, my great grand, my grandfather was a farmer back in Louisiana. Uh, we're third generation farmers um, and we have, uh, uh, my family still operates a rice and crawfish farm. So we're always going to have that in our form. We're not ever going to get rid of that. We're always going to have that in our family. Um, and it's something that we can be proud of. Um, and um, so that's just part of our history. And a lot of people want that in their family lives and so forth. You always have a fresh supply of veggies and meat for your family and friends. That's a good thing. And you always get to make new friends and networks in the farming community. Obviously, again, like I said, you can't do this all yourself. You're going to need information from outside sources. You're going to need to talk to other people in the industry. You're going to need to find out what worked, what didn't work and different things like that. Case in point being a couple years ago, not that long ago, we had a really big uh, emphasis on hemp production. Um, hemp has become legal in the state of Texas, and so everybody was going to grow hemp. And so Oh, eventually over the um, the last year or so, we found out that through trials and efforts and different things, um, hemp isn't necessarily being able to be grown in all parts of the state that we thought it was going to be able to be grown in. And it's a very expensive crop to grow. Um, it has a very short shelf life whenever to get it out of the field, to get it to this, uh, the plant where it can be extracted and different things like that. So we wouldn't know that if we didn't have a good resource uh, base in place. Some of the cons, um, weather can be your friend or enemy. Obviously, if you don't like working outside, it's going to be real tough to be a farmer or rancher. You have to be able to uh, go out in the heat uh, during the pretty rough uh, summers that we have here in Texas and not be able, be able to uh, uh, sweat and also be able to handle the cold at the same time. Um, you must make, be able to make tough decisions. That kind of goes with being your own boss. So we know as a boss, uh, you have to make some tough decisions. And sometimes these tough decisions are not only going to affect your family, but it's also going to affect your, uh, your way of life. Uh, you know, a couple years ago, uh, when the drought hit Texas, uh, and it was pretty severe and the water, water, uh, dried up in several uh, places out in West Texas and so forth. We couldn't ship enough hay in and so forth. So some of these farmers had to make the tough decision of calling um, some of their cattle, um, just getting rid of their cattle, lowering the number of uh, head that they had. Um, you know, where is that, where is that um, cattle going to go? You know, are you going to be selling it to uh, the local slaughterhouse? Are you going to be selling it to uh, a feedlot? You know, are you going to be able to find a buyer for it and different things like that? So those are all some of the tough decisions that you have to make. Markets can be high and low. Um, you know, uh, beef, beef and pork especially. Um, you can have highs and you can have lows. It depends. Uh, depends on, like, say for example, right now 
the the port market is getting ready to open up quite a bit. Um, the USDA has been doing a lot of um, uh, negotiating with China as far as exporting a lot of our pork into China. Um, so that's going to open up the pork market a lot for us. Uh, a couple years ago, um, before uh, Cuba was shut down again, we were looking at trying to ship more rice down there and so forth. So that was going to be good news for the rice farmers. So it really depends on uh, the fluctuation of the market and really the uh, the cattle, the the livestock market up that's up in Chicago and everything. You have um, long term trading, you have short term trading, um, you know, so it gets into a lot of different things that are out of really your control. So sometimes you just kind of have to ride the good with the good and the bad with the bad. Early mornings and late nights, um, you got to get the coffee ready early in the morning usually before sun uh, sunrise. Um, and so, for example, you know, if you got, um, you know, 20 or 30 head of cattle out there that need to be fed uh, or moved from pasture to pasture, you need to get that up and going as soon as you can um, before you get, if you, especially if you have another job, if you're a hobby farmer and you have less time, um, less head of cattle or less, uh, pigs or anything like that, uh, you might be able to get away with something, uh, you know, more reasonable on your time frame and so so forth. So uh, just keep that in mind. And then obviously startup can always be expensive, especially if you're starting up from scratch. Uh, if you are lucky enough to be in a family or you have family that has equipment or land that you can borrow from them or lease from them and so forth, uh, that's always going to be at a better option as far as buying new um, because new tractors, new combines and everything uh, with the new technology out there, you're looking at like uh, every bit of a half a million dollars uh, to purchase some of these new equipment that is out there. Um, but again, uh, don't blow your mind because that's more large scale. If you're doing something one or two acres, yes, you can get something used. Um, check the marketplace, check the farm bulletins, different things like that for smaller used tractors. Uh, you can always make good bargains and good deals with people who might, farmers or ranchers who might be retiring. Um, so, but if you're looking at much larger acres, you're going to have to really put a lot of money out there. So that's getting ready to kind of wrap up my presentation. Uh, Brandy, before I go into my last slide, do you have any questions I need to address? Uh, I do have one. Uh, the question is, Robert asks, what ag exemption can be, can you get for goats? So, um, if it, again, it depends on if it's in Harris County or if it's another county. So Robert would, um, Robert, I suggest you, wherever your land is at, um, you either need to Google Harris County uh, appraisal district and go to livestock exemptions. And there's a full chart there of uh, what you need as far as per head on an acre to be able to get that. Uh, if your land is in Waller County or Montgomery County or Brazos County or whatever, you're going to need to go to that specific county and pull it up there. So it again, it's going to depend on where your land is at and um, and get started with that. All Anything right. Else, oh. Oh, you know what? There is some, there is another one. Um, how many weeks should we start to fatten cattle before selling? What feeds should we use? So you're saying how many weeks and then what feed? Yep. How okay. many weeks to start in order to fatten the cattle before selling? Well, um, that's kind of open ended question. So uh, if if I mean, you're looking at uh, it depends on mm, several factors there. Um, what I would do is whoever asked that question, um, if I could, I don't have enough time to address all the answers to that particular question. If you could email me or Brandy, if you could put my email address in the chat box and have that person email me, I will be glad to answer that off to the side uh, because there's some more information I need to get from that person. OK, I already have an email um, going to you okay. with, with that person's email. So all right. So with that, we're going to go ahead and go into my last slide. And um, this is one of my all time favorite videos. This was from the Super Bowl back in 2013. And this is uh, recited by Mr. Paul Harvey. 
and he actually recited in, in doing a little research on this, he actually recited this at the National FFA Convention as his speech in 1978, I found out. Mr. Paul Harvey was a great orator uh, back in the 70s and 80s and just had a really, really good voice. And, and uh, uh, Ram, Dodge Ram, uh, commissioned him to, to do this ad for the Super Bowl commercial. And it really hit home for a lot of people, especially in the agriculture arena and so forth. And with, um, hopefully the volume on this works. So um, Brandy, I guess somebody will type in the chat if they can't hear it, but um, we're gonna give it a shot. And on the eighth, I can hear it. Day, okay. God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody willing to get up before dawn, milk cows, work all day in the fields, milk cows again, eat supper, then go to town and stay past midnight at a meeting of the school board. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody willing to sit up all night with a newborn colt and watch it die and dry his eyes and say, maybe next year. I need somebody who can shape an ax handle from a persimmon sprout, shoe a horse with a hunk of car tire, who can make harness out of hay wire feed sacks and shoe scraps, who planting time and harvest season will finish his 40 hour week by Tuesday noon and then pain in from tractor back, put in another 72 hours. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody strong enough to clear trees and heave bales yet gentle enough to yean lambs and wean pigs and tend to pink combed pullets who will stop his mower for an hour to splint the broken leg of a meadow lark. So God made a farmer. It had to be somebody who'd plow deep and straight and not cut corners. Somebody to seed, weed, feed, breed and rake and disc and plow and plant and tie the fleece and strain the milk. Somebody who'd bail a family together with the soft, strong bonds of sharing, who would laugh and then sigh and then reply with smiling eyes when his son says that he wants to spend his life doing what dad does. So God made a farmer. Awesome. All right. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed that little clip and uh, we that concludes my presentation today. Um, I have included some information there. Uh, my name, my email address. Uh, if you haven't uh, joined us on Facebook yet, um, that link is up and running Harris County ANR on Facebook. You can find us there on Twitter. We're at Harris Extension. Uh, we've just started Twitter um, probably a couple months now. So if you're on that social media, uh, feel free to join us. Uh, I'm still learning a lot about Twitter, so um, bear with us. But we do post a lot of information on Facebook on the Harris County A&R page. Um, the last thing I want to share with everybody is if you're a current uh, pesticide applicator license holder here in the state of Texas, we will be offering our vegetative management conference, which will be Friday, January 14th or Wednesday, January 19th. You will pick one of those days. Uh, registration will begin on, uh, will open this Monday, December 6th. The January 14th location will be in Baytown and the January 19th location will be in Tomball. We will be offering five CEU credits and you can email me or, um, the uh, flyer for each location will be on the Harris County Facebook page, or you can email me or Miss Susan Hubert, um, and we'll get that flyer out to you. Uh, early bird registration is $50 on December 26th. It changes to $60. So you will get five CEU credits, or you have the possibility to get uh, five CEU credits and a great lunch to go along with it. So, um, with that being said, Brandy, that is the end of my presentation. If you have anything to um, to add, but I enjoyed being with all of you today. Um, again, um, I know it's a little early, but Merry Christmas. 
from um, the Ag Department and myself and um, Brandy. Uh, let's see. Nope, just, uh, you know, thank yous, great presentation. So thank you, Shannon, for another uh, wonderful presentation. Some of these are, you know, just really new to, um, you know, to, new to me, <laughs> you know, when it comes to egg. So I can only imagine that, you know, maybe they're helpful to you too. Uh, join us in two weeks for our last presentation on how to make holiday plants last. All right, thank you so much and see you next time. Thanks everybody. Have a great day.